when I was a youth minister and associate pastor for many years, I said if I ever got a church, I would always take the Lord's Supper seriously. And uh, I want you to know today, and I am asking you to totally focus on Scripture today and, and totally focus on Jesus Christ. Folks, we cannot thank Him enough for what He did for us. We say His blood was shed, but I know we believe His blood was shed. But you, I, I just don't think we can grasp in our minds what He went through for you and I. It was terrible. A cat of nine tails. People would literally die of the, that beating. But yet, He went to the cross for you and I. And so today is a serious time. It is a solemn time. It is a time where we need to focus on our relationship with Jesus Christ. And just as Denise sang, we need to say thank you today for what Christ has done for us. Today I'd like to talk to you about Christmas communion. Christmas communion. I know no better way to start the Christmas season than with communion with our Lord and Savior. If you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. We will start there, and we have several passages. If you want to follow along in our bulletin and take notes, uh, you are welcome to do that. But today, we are preparing our hearts for the Lord's Supper. We are preparing our minds for the Lord's Supper. We are focusing only on God, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit today. All three of those uh, were there. All three of those were a vital part of God's ministry to His people. Number one, if you're taking notes, Jesus' miraculous birth. Jesus' miraculous birth. Number two, Jesus' anointed baptism. Folks, baptism is important. It does not save you but it is an important. The two ordinance of a, a New Testament church are baptism and the Lord's Supper. And we baptized just a couple of weeks ago, and hopefully we'll baptize again soon. But that is one of the ordinances, and the Lord's Supper is the other one. And the third one is Jesus' sacrificial death. And I will say right now, folks, I cannot describe in words what he went through. I'll attempt to. But I do not think we understand the pain and the sorrow, his brokenness, him seeing mankind the way they are. But yet, he loved us so much, he was willing to die for us. There are over 300 prophecies in the Old Testament which speak of the birth of Jesus. The virgin birth is an incredible, miraculous story of the power of God doing the impossible. Folks, our God can do the impossible. And I, I, sometimes I even don't know that all Christians believe that. But there is nothing our God can't do. Jesus' life was amazing and divinely inspired by God. His death was no accident. It was God's redemptive plan from the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. The bottom line to today is, Jesus was born to die and lived his whole life in the shadow of the cross of Calvary. My prayer today is that you will see and remember the great price that was paid for you as we partake of the Lord's Supper together. Let's look at Jesus' miraculous birth. In Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, and you will see the first 17 verses it is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. All right? The genealogy of Jesus Christ. But in the 18th verse, we'll start with Jesus' miraculous birth. There was no other conception like Jesus' conception. And we'll show you that in the importance of that in just a few minutes. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. This is his story. This is Jesus' story. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. And here we see the beginning 
and, and even uh, the miracle that happened there. Mary and Joseph were not very old. Uh, you know, uh, history tells us, uh, Bible prophecy tells us also that they were young. They were probably somewhere around 14 or 15 years old, but in that day, that was not unusual. In betrothed, we use the word engaged. Okay, now you get engaged, but their engagement was different than our engagement. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, those who are thinking about getting married, I, I recommend as a minister of the gospel that you be engaged one year before you get married so that you can truly know who this person is. That's my opinion in that. You're welcome, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Folks, it's important, okay? It's very important. But they would get engaged, and they would keep living their lives with their families. They were not together. And for one year, they dated, okay? They were engaged. They were around each other, but they didn't stay with one another, and they didn't sleep with one another. And then they would come to this time of wedding where we have our wedding celebrations. They would consummate it, and they would have that, a, a Jewish wedding on. So this had not taken place yet. Joseph had not had relations with Mary. And folks, that is important. Listen to me, girls. Keep yourself pure for your wedding day. That is God's will for your life. So if you think about this and read this, you're, it's going to pop up in your head. Joseph was thinking, what in the world is going on here? Before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. All right? Joseph knew she was pregnant. Joseph knew it wasn't him that got her pregnant. So in his mind, he was thinking she had to have some kind of an affair. That was the human side of this. And Joseph had the right to do one of two things. He could divorce her quietly, okay, and it just not be known. It would be almost like a breakup, but obviously more serious because it was a divorce. Or he could have her stoned. The Old Testament, Leviticus 20.10, it tells you there that if, if you have an adulterous relationship before you're married, and before, before you're married, then they can stone you. So this was a serious accusation. This was a serious thing. And Joseph did not want uh, to embarrass her or her family. But while he thought about these things, and believe me, folks, that is deep thinking there. Joseph had to really, really weigh what was going on here. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take uh, to you Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And I'm sure Joseph was thinking, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? How does the Holy Spirit conceive a child? And folks, I am telling you, the virgin birth is a critical doctrine that made Jesus different from anyone ever born. See, Jesus had no sin nature. Psalm 51.5 says, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. So if you, and, and that's how you got here, folks. I'm not trying to teach you a lesson here. I, you know how you got here. You had a father, and you had a mother. They conceived, and you came out. You were the baby there. But this is different. The Holy Spirit, God placed the Holy Spirit in her. Joseph was not Jesus' biological father. Old Testament prophecy, even at the lintage, I forgot to tell you, uh, said Isaiah chapter 11 verse 1, that Jesus would come from the lintage of David. So all these things are extremely, extremely important. So let's keep going. Verse 21, And she will bring forth a son, 
Notice the capitalization of that. Son, deity, God in human flesh, who, who, that's who Jesus was. And you shall call his name Jesus. Okay, Jesus means Jehovah is salvation. That's exactly what his name meant. For he will save his people from their sins. And when you talk about uh, Old Testament prophecy, hold your finger there and go to Isaiah chapter 14 with me. Look in the Old Testament, Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. I'm getting there. Isaiah, oh, no, excuse me, 714. No wonder I couldn't find it. Isaiah 714. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. And Emmanuel meant God with us. So we have Jesus who means uh, Jehovah is, is salvation. We have Emmanuel, which means God is with us. He was the perfect Son of God. And the only way He could be perfect is to be conceived by the Holy Spirit. Verse 22, So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. Then Joseph, being aroused from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took to him his wife. He did not know her until she had brought forth her first son, and he called his name Jesus. What was the purpose of Jesus? Isaiah 9, go back to Isaiah if you would. Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9, verse 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born. Notice the capital C. Deity, Jesus is son. Or God's son, excuse me. Unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So we see in Matthew chapter 1, and uh, we will also see, we will look uh, later on, in, the, in the, literal, the literal birth of Jesus. It'll give the detail in another sermon uh, we will preach in a week or so. So we see here the miraculous birth of Jesus. The second thing I want you to see is Jesus' uh, Jesus's anointed baptism. Look in Matthew 3. Matthew 3.13. Matthew 3.13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John, at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me? Folks, I'm telling you, I would know exactly how John had felt. John, and I believe in that day, spiritual people could sense who Jesus was. All he had to do was walk into a room or walk into a city, and you knew who he was by his countenance, uh, just by who he is, by how... He, he conducted himself as the Son of God. And John looked at him and said, I mean, let me paraphrase it. Are you kidding me? I can't baptize you. I'm not worthy to baptize you. Well, folks, who would be worthy to baptize Jesus? It's like people tell me, even at the Lord's Supper, I'm not worthy to partake of the Lord's Supper. Folks, it's not sinless perfection. No one. Jesus is the only one that was sinless. It's being confessed up. It's being right with God. Just as John felt like he couldn't do this, I'm telling you, Jesus and God chose him for this task. Verse 15, But Jesus answered and said unto him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then 
he allowed him. Basically, Jesus was saying, I need to do this. God the Father told me to get baptized. God the Father wanted you to do the baptizing. And it is the will of God. And it says, and when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water to come from wa the water. you got to be in the water. Baptism is immersion, okay? It is not being sprinkled. I'm not trying to put any religion down. I'm telling you, you, come, you go down in the water, you are dipped into the water, and, and you come out of the water. And why, do we be, why are we being baptized? You know the number one reason we ought to be baptized? Because Jesus was baptized. If it was good enough for Jesus, surely it's good enough for us. Okay, and I'll, I'll give you in a, just a minute some more reasons why we should be baptized. Jesus came immediately out of the water, and behold, the heavens opened up to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove. What happened? God the Father said, do it. Jesus the Son did it. The Holy Spirit came down like a dove and landed on Jesus Christ. It's almost like the ordination. All right, he, his hands, uh, God's voice came down. And by the way, it only, he only spoke three times from heaven. This is one. Two was at the tra uh, transfiguration, and three was right before the cross, those three times. But notice what he said. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Now, folks, Jesus was baptized and there's, there's, I, I just listed five reasons. I think uh, if you have come to know Christ, if you have the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, you should be baptized. First, it started Jesus' ministry. Okay, the baptism. After this, he took off in ministry. And folks, we all have a ministry. I know people will say, well, I'm not a minister. I didn't say you were a minister. I said we have a ministry. We have things that God wants us to do. So it started Jesus' ministry. Number two, it was the identification with the New Testament church. We know the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We know the day of Pentecost. We know what happened that day. And it lined up with, and that's what baptism does. Baptism makes you a member of that Bible-believing church. Number three, it is a picture of Jesus' death burial, and resurrection. It is a picture. Think about what we say. Buried with Christ in baptism, raised to walk in the newness of life. And I'll show you this in just a second. Number four, it's a testimony to everyone out in this sanctuary. It's saying, and they, you don't have to say a word. We who baptize says the words. But it's telling everybody out here that you had asked for forgiveness of your sins, you have invited Jesus into your life, and you are sure that when you die, you would go to heaven. That is a testimony. And number four, it is an act of obedience. I believe it's the first thing Jesus asks you to do. And again, new converts, it takes time. All right, not everyone grew up in a Baptist church. Not all churches do the things that we do. But we are simply, we have the Baptist faith and message, and we follow that. We have the Word of God, and we follow that. And that is what uh, I believe are the reasons that uh, you need to be baptized if you have been saved. Now, look at, the, look at, look at Romans. I want you to see this. A lot of people haven't seen this in Romans. Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Verse 1. Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Okay? And again, when we get saved, it doesn't mean we're not going to sin. It just means the Holy Spirit is inside of us, and we, when we sin, the Holy Spirit tells us, you just messed up. You just messed up. All right? And then it says, certainly not. Matter of fact, I've, I've memorized the first two verses here. It helps me when temptation is around. What shall I say then? Shall I continue to sin that grace may abound? 
God forbid. How can I, me, who has died to sin, live any longer therein? And by that memorization, you are quoting Scripture, and that temptation seems to fall away from you. So he's basically saying, let me sum it up. Don't be a disgrace to grace. See, there's legalism. That's the far right. All right? But there's also, uh, you know, the deal that, you know, liberalism, which basically means, and again, not politics, it means, hey, and I've heard people say it, well, I, I, I know it's a sin, I'm going to do it anyway, and I'm just going to ask God to forgive me. That's a disgrace to grace, folks. We should not have that attitude. If you truly are saved, you don't want to sin. Doesn't mean you don't sin. I mean, King David, he did the big two, folks. You say what you want, he committed adultery and he committed murder. But yet, the Word says, you know, that he was a man after God's own heart. God forgives people of sin if they genuinely repent. Repent. And that's what it means. Now look what it says. Verse 3, Or do you not know as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized in his death? You know what part of being saved is? It's dying to self. Dying to self. And folks, we need to die to self. And when somebody dies, what do they do? They have a burial. And this is a picture of baptism. This is a picture of it. Baptized in his death. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. And I've heard people say this, folks. They've said, I want to be rebaptized. Folks, I don't find the word rebaptized in the Word of God. But I do find scriptural baptism. For instance, I have been baptized three times. When I was five years old, God came to church, evangelist, and just scared me half to death. Okay? I mean, he scared me. And his word was, I remember, I was sitting, just, my parents always said about four rows back. If, in our auditorium, it, in law, they'd be right around there. And he said, if you don't want to go to hell, you get down here. I don't remember who I talked to. I don't remember what I prayed. I didn't remember. All I knew was I didn't want to go to hell. So what I did, I got dipped. I got wet. When I was 14 years old, I was baptized again because on Friday night, in uh, Marty at Falls Creek Youth Camp. 5,000 kids a week go to Falls Creek. And I, I wanted to be saved. I knew I needed to be saved. God was calling me to be saved. And I'm telling you, I said a prayer, and things changed for a few weeks till I went back to school and got back around my buddies and did the same thing. I made a false profession of faith. I got dipped twice. But my true baptism came when I was 22 years old. I was already youth minister at Cameron Baptist Church. And I had a friend of mine say, well, what if they fire you? They might have hired a lost guy. I said, that's their fault, not my fault. <laughs> they should have checked me out better. And you know what I said? I don't care what people say. I got saved. Folks, my life changed that day. It was a Saul to Paul thing. And that baptism was special, folks. It was special. And that's what he is saying here. For, the, for if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Jesus was the ultimate example of why we are baptized. Not because he was a sinner, okay? But as an example for us to follow. So we see Jesus' miraculous birth. We see Jesus' anointed baptism. And the third thing I want you to see is Jesus' sacrificial death. And again, here, I could have picked any of the Gospels. Any of the Gospels. Uh, we could have gotten much deeper into it. Uh, but God just really told me 
This, this sums up, this scripture right here sums up Jesus' sacrificial death. We know about the trial, folks. It was a sham, okay? Liars, liar, liar, pants on fire. And that kills me. For somebody put their hand on a Bible and said, so help me God, you need to tell the truth, all right? I'd be afraid to say that and then lie, to be honest with you, okay? But the, the trial was a sham. Uh, you know, the whole experience of the cat of nine tails, it was just cruel, folks, cruel. He had done nothing wrong, nothing wrong. But yet, they would take him over Barabbas, a known thief, a known murderer, and they were crying out, give us Barabbas. How do you think that made Jesus feel? You ever think about that? How would it make you feel? You are totally innocent. But the Bible says in the trial, Jesus said not a word. Why didn't he defend himself? Because he came to die, folks. This was God's plan. This was God's will. Verse 28, John 19, 28. After this, after this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel full of sour wine and, and, and was sitting there, and they filled the sponge with sour wine and put it on hyssop and put it to his mouth. And we know that this, this was you know, a, a deadening thing. It would, it would the alcohol and all that, uh, many, many of them would take little drinks of it. But here's what I believe, folks. I believe Jesus was so dehydrated. His lips were so swollen. All he needed was something, just a little liquid, so that he could say this last sentence. And it said, so when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. Tetelestai is the word, is the word, the Greek word, and it means paid in full. Paid in full. And folks, our debt has been paid. Jesus Christ has paid for every sin you have ever committed and will commit. Jesus paid for our sins. He knew what He was doing. He knew what it would take. He loved us so much that He was willing to die, to take our place. And bowing His head, He gave up His spirit. Folks, Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. When they pulled his beard, it hurt. When the Roman soldier slapped his face, it hurt. He knew the pain of everything he was going through, but he went through that pain for you and I. Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53. Just want to read a portion of this. Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. We are healed physically. We are healed emotionally. We are he healed uh, physically, folks. I believe in God's healing power. And the chastisement for peace was on him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. And we have turned everyone into his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Every sin, folks, think about this. Every sin you've ever committed. Every sin anyone was committed. Why do you think it was dark those last three hours? Why do you think Jesus said, my God, my God, why are you forsaking me? Because God could not look at sin. All of our sin was laid on Jesus Christ. He paid for your sins. That blood that was running down the cross, 
is payment for your sins. And we never need to take that lightly, folks. We will stand before God pure and holy and clean because of the blood of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says it best. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he who made... For he, God, who made him Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Oh, folks, death, Jesus' death was not an accident. It was a divine appointment. But praise God, when Jesus died, they laid him in a tomb. And on the third day, Jesus arose. Jesus arose from the dead. And that's the reason we will live forever. That's the reason we have eternal life, because of Jesus and what he did for us. The chains of death were broken. God and Jesus broke those chains. And the Lord's Supper is for us to remember the high price Jesus paid with his body, which is reputation of the, of his, of the bread, and with, with his blood, representation of the juice. So I'm asking you today, I'm asking you before we partake of the Lord's Supper, are you right with God? I didn't say are you perfect. Are you prayed up? Are you confessed up? Have you done business with God, preparing your heart, your mind, your soul, and your body for the Lord's Supper? That's why we have a time of invitation. And at this time, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you don't know Him, today would be a great day to be saved. And if you're a Christian, maybe you need to rededicate your life to Christ. Maybe, and these altars are open, for, folks. It's for you. It's for you. That's what these altars, that's why we built the church this way, so that we can throw ourselves on the altar and ask God for forgiveness. And not just that, but just come and pray. If you just want to pray and you just want to come and thank God for the cross, you come and then if you need to follow the Lord in baptism, man, just talk to us. We'd love to set that up. We'd love to help you uh, with that decision. And then also, if you, you, know, you choose to uh, join our church, uh, we will talk to you about that also. Father, God, this is your church, and these are your people. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would just help us if we come to this place in the service. God, I pray that we would just realize how important uh, preparing our hearts is. And God, I just pray that you would just speak to us, Lord, through the Holy Spirit. God, I thank you for the cross. I thank you for your death. I thank you for your blood and your body that was, was hurt for us. And God, I pray as we look into the Lord's Supper, Lord, that we would just examine ourselves. God, we love you. We thank you for this time. And God, we just want to do business with you. But Lord, I just pray that we would just be obedient. Thank you so much for this time that we have together. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.